building regulations, England and Wales, are administered by local authorities, building inspectors, and by approved inspectors. Approved inspectors came into existence in 1985 as an alternative delivery model for the approval of dwellings. In 1998, they were finally allowed to provide services for any building type, and in 1999, the Construction Industry Council, the CIC, based at the Building Centre in London, became responsible for the approval of all approved inspectors. This programme will look at the role and responsibilities, the benefits and the drawbacks of using an improved inspector to assess compliance with building regulations. In the second part of the programme, we'll also be looking at the changing face of the building control service and forthcoming amendments to the approved documents. So to help us explain and explore some of these issues, we have Jeff Wilkinson, Vice Chair, Association of Consultant Approved Inspectors. Welcome, Jeff, and thanks for coming in. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about the Association of Consultant Approved Inspectors, the ACAI, and just let us know what you do? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, it does pretty much what it says on the tin. It's um, a trade body that represents the 60 or so practicing uh, consultant approved inspectors. Uh, these can range from large corporate organisations down to small individuals. Uh, we're there pretty much to represent those um, companies and individuals, to lobby government and to, to bring about best practice. Approved inspectors were born out of the deregulation of the 1980s and 1990s, weren't they? So can you just tell us what was wrong with the old system, or to put it another way, uh, what do you think approved inspectors have really brought to the construction industry in the last 30 years? I think it's pretty much um, recognised that, that it has brought about significant changes and improvements in standards. Um, I think it's important first to actually go back to, to the 1980s and, and look at the standards that, that were being applied then and the problems that you actually had. Um, certainly at that time there was a, a real lack of uh, local authorities going out and looking at, at sites and, and enforcing the regulations then. Um, and what's happened since then with the um, advent of approved inspectors is a substantial change and improvement in the standard and quality and the, the real customer ethos. Um, whereas before it was you'll do what we'll tell you to do, uh, it's now much more part of the team. Okay, so is what sets apart an approved inspector to a building control officer, is it the site visits or is there more? I think there's a lot more. I think it, it predominantly focuses on the relationship that you enjoy between the approved inspector and uh, the architect or the surveyor or whichever member of the design team you actually are. Um, in terms of experience, the majority of approved inspectors have actually come from a local authority background where they're fed up with the bureaucracy of, of local government. Um, and because they really wanted to deliver high quality services and standards. Is the implication there that building control officers don't? Certainly it was the case in the 1980s that they didn't and obviously now that a lot has changed since then and that's been due to the, the advent of the approved inspector. Um, I think if you're working with a good quality local authority then you'll get a good quality standard. Uh, I would say that it does vary though throughout the country. Okay, but I mean one of the main differences is that uh, approved inspectors, unlike a local authority, have got no formal powers, have they, to enforce the regulation? I mean there, there are quite a, a series of, of of different um, of differences be between the two. Uh, the fundamental part, which is almost like an MOT for a building, is actually the same thing that, that both actually do. Um, probably one of the first differences that um, any client would would need to appreciate is say is the relationship issue. The second one is the fact um, that we actually have to be qualified and competent in the first instance. Um, there is an assessment process that you actually have to go through in order to become an approved inspector. Um, you also need to hold insurance so if anything does go wrong with, with what you're doing, you will actually get some form of comeback to them. But coming back to the, the initial point that you made on the, the enforcement side of stuff, um, I think it's only right and proper that the enforcement side of the, the regulation stays very much within the public sector for um, consumer confidence issues as much as anything else. Um, if, if you use the MOT as an example, there are a lot of MOT testing stations around, but you wouldn't expect them to, to uh, pull you over for, for doing 80 miles an hour on the motorway. Um, well, look, it, it does lead on to the question as to why would anyone bother to get an approved inspector. If you've got no enforcement mm. power, surely it's better to get approval, keep the whole thing in-house with the local authority. It depends on, again, how you actually view it. I mean, the, 
what I think most people actually want is a good high quality service coming um, from, from building control and a compliant building at the end of it. Um, given that that's the case, um, it's very rare that you would actually need to enforce the building regulations. It's a, a work together with kind of arrangement rather than working against and that's one of the fundamental changes from the 80s. Um, but principally, by, do it, by taking that kind of approach, you overcome the problems in the first instance and that delivers a much better uh, product at the end of it. When you're actually talking about the enforcement side, I would reckon that a roughly 1% of um, applications that, that my members see would be reverted back through people choosing not to comply. Uh, it's a very, very small number overall. Um, in terms of um, total uh, market share, uh, we probably hold 30 to 40% market share in terms of value of, of projects, uh, slightly less in, in sheer numbers, but it's a very, very small percentage overall. Okay, so can you just tell me the process of your involvement with the client and then maybe with the local authority? How do you play those two um, uh, clients, I suppose? Yeah. The involvement of the local authority is simply a case that we would serve a notice saying that we are in effect replacing them during the, the course of this process. The relationship with the client is very, very much different. It's one that would develop over a period of time. If you're working on just a one-off project, um, then that's slightly different to something that you're, if, if you're repeating the same kind of projects, if you're working for a chain of hotels, for example, there are lessons to be learned and you take those from one project to another to another. But the earlier that you can get building control involved in the process, the more value that engineers back into the, the project overall by doing that. And that's where the real benefits actually come, not in the actual checking process, but by engineering at the early stages a compliant building to overcome the problems and keep those going through the whole of the design process. So each time a, a variation is made, we're there on hand to say, this is the knock-on effect of that variation. Okay, well, on that, um, type approval is kind of very popular uh, these days, so can you just explain what type approval yeah. is, and, and to a certain extent, whether local authorities offer something different with type approval and scheme approval than you would? Um, there are some differences between the two, but if I deal first with, with what type approval probably is, um, it's born out of the mass housing estates that um, have, have developed over the years and was something that, that one of our members in HBC were probably prime in, in bringing about, whereby uh, if you have a particular housing type, a Windsor or something of that nature, um, that you're repeating again and again and again. In effect, it only needs to be checked once, okay, and then you get the benefit of doing that, that over and over again. Um, the difference between local authority type approvals and approved inspectors type approvals is that approved inspectors operate nationally throughout the country and you therefore have the person who approved your plan actually checking it when it comes to site. Um, in the case of the local authorities, that's not necessarily the case because you could still get some sort of local interpretation, let's say, um, from the, the actual local surveyor that has the job of, it, of checking the previously approved type approval. So you can go to a local authority where you think you might get the most sympathetic hearing? Um, in terms of a type approval, you, you can go to someone that's got the experience um, to be able to deal with that. Um, again, one of the big differences between approved inspectors and local authorities is that the local authority can't actually turn work away because they don't have the experience to deal with it. In the case of an approved inspector, you actually have to have um, before you sign up to, to any contract, um, the ability to resource that particular project and the experience and competence to be able to handle it. Okay. Um, in terms of the uh, LABC's uh, home warranty scheme, uh, which, uh, as I understand, resulted from the OFT, the Office of Fair Trading's investigation into home building in the UK, can you just explain what that's all about? It seems to be part of an opening up of the market. In, indeed, very much so. For probably 15 odd years um, since the NHBC came into, into the marketplace. Um, there has effectively been a duopoly between local authority building control and HBC building control within the uh, residential market. Changes um, to the legislation and something called the warranty link rule that I won't bore you with the details of meant that the marketplace was now open to other building control bodies providing services within that part of the market. Because of that, um, certain warranty providers have come in. Um, there's Building Life Plans BLP, there's Zurich, and there's um, Premier Guarantee. 
all who are, are offering alternative products uh, alongside the um, local authorities' products, um, because it, it's clear that there's a, a need in that particular element of the, the market for greater competition. Okay. And you mentioned competence before and training and, uh, and qualifications. How is the competence assessed of a, uh, a proof inspector? Well, during your introduction, you, you mentioned the, the Construction Industry Council, and it's through the Construction Industry Council. Um, an approved inspector has to go through um, a very detailed process of assessment and competence to show how its staff will actually meet a series of, of criteria for experience for a, a wide range of building types. Um, it will need to show that it has insurance in place and it will need to show that it has complaints procedure, for example, in place. So that there are mechanisms that if there is anything wrong, you can actually go back and get these things corrected. Um, it's certainly not a walk in the park, that, that I really, really must emphasise. And because of the five year renewal process, um, a number of our members have just gone through the second renewal phase now. And it's not an automatic process that, that these things will be open will be granted um, and there have been a number of applications that have been turned down in the past as well. Right. Um, just finally I read that the Association of Consultant Approved Inspectors is happy for local authorities to keep the power of enforcement for themselves and I just wonder why that is. Wouldn't an AI have more weight if actually you were allowed to maybe make decisions without having recourse to the local authority? We do have the power to, to make decisions throughout. The difference is that what we don't have is we don't have um, the ability to issue enforcement proceedings through the court. And I think it's very important, again, for consumer confidence that that remains outside of the pro uh, private sector and remains with the public sector. Um, the, the issues that you're actually talking about, stop notices, fines, uh, things of that nature, uh, really should remain there. And I think, it's also important to stress that that's probably one of the most important issues as we, we move forward um, to actually look at that and see what's happening in the market because when we hear the horror stories of building control being in crisis that we, we see buildings not complying that is about enforcement and that is the, the role of the local authority and I think that there are concerns that local authority resources are being moved from the enforcement role into the competitive market where they can generate funds rather than concentrating on the areas where where we have substantial non-compliance. Okay, very good. Well, look, we've dealt with the uh, basis of approved inspectors and what they bring to the table. Let's move on to the building regulations themselves. 2009 will see some fundamental changes to the regulations. Apart from the fact that Part G, hygiene, is being upgraded, the next phase of Part L, energy conservation, will be floated in 2009, ready for implementation in 2010, although, as we know, they aren't always released on time. But more broadly, the impact of the review of the future of building control will begin to kick in. So let's start with uh, that review, Jeff. Can you just give us a few ideas about what may be planned under the review of building control? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, the government have stated that it's their view that uh, the building control system is flawed but not sunk by any stretch of the imagination. So what they seem to be doing is tinkering around the edges. The vast majority of, of the proposals that they've actually put forward are very much at the low end of the market or the domestic end of the market. They're looking at things like alterations to the way in which the um, guidance in the approved documents is, is produced and perhaps, for, as an example, producing a, a general guide to home extensions, conversions, things of that, that kind, where you're bringing together all of the relevant information into one clear, concise document, rather than wading through dozens and dozens of documents as you do at the moment. But what about Part G and Part L themselves? Is there anything that we should be on the lookout for? In terms of the regulation changes themselves, yeah, um, Part G is one of those <laughs> great parts of the regulations that you kind of ignore and you think you know what they include and what they don't include. When you actually go back and check, you find that they didn't contain what you thought they contained in the first instance. Uh, a good example of that is that one of the proposals is a requirement being brought in to bring in a, a need for wholesome water to be uh, provided to dwellings. That used to be called potable water. Uh, I believe it did. Um, whether there's any significant difference between the two definitions is yet to come out, but somehow I doubt it. And the fact that everyone always provided potable water, is, I mean, is there any impact of that being introduced in the regs? Uh, I can see absolutely none whatsoever. Um, the, the only potential benefit is if we actually um, remove some of the requirements from the water regulations and put them into the building regulations, and then eventually 
get rid of the water regulations completely. So we've got one clear, concise area to, to actually be looked at. All right, so Part G, dealing with water, there's an awful lot of water conservation uh, within that document. You might want to pad that out a little bit. But also in Part L, uh, obviously everyone's always on the lookout for what's the changes in Part L. Energy conservation, and again, do you have any clues what might be forthcoming? Very much so. If we deal with, with the Part G parts first, um, underneath the, uh, the headlines of we now require water for, for dwellings, uh, there will also be uh, the permission for grey water to be used in toilets, things of like that, for example. But perhaps the most uh, politically sensitive of the requirements will be a 125 litres per person limitation on the amount of water that uh, each dwelling uh, Occupy will actually be able to use. Now quite how that will uh, plan out in the longer term because more and more of the regulations are becoming usage based rather than constructionally based um, and that could present uh, building control authorities with quite a problem in assessing whether a four bed house will actually be occupied by two people or four people and what then would be the appropriate way in which to apply the regulations. Um, dealing with Part L, I think it's safe to say that the government's agenda has been relatively clearly set out, certainly in terms of housing. We're looking at a 25% improvement uh, on the, the previous or stroke current regulations. In, in uh, what, carbon emissions? Or what in, in, carb in carbon emissions. So the, the target values will be improved by 20%, uh, sorry, 25%. Um, that's for 2010. Then there'll be a 44% saving. Why they couldn't make 45, I'm not sure. Um, for the further follow up in 2013, uh, with a long term aim of zero carbon in uh, 2016. So are there any other aspects of Part L on air tightness, perhaps? Very much so. I mean, one of the problems that you've got as we move forward is actually how we're going to achieve the uh, 20, 25, 44% increases as, as time goes on. Um, and one of the key factors to that is the air tightness of, of the building. What we're likely to see is accredited details being introduced to um, give you a, a greater guide on what you actually need to, to be putting into the building. And Bisri has done some research on air tightness, haven't they? They have indeed. They've um, done some research where instead of um, 10 metres cubed per hour per metre squared, they've, they've, they've taken two equivalent buildings, put one at eight and one at four, um, and the better performing one, the one at four, um, achieved over 30% carbon saving uh, in its gas bill compared with the, the eight one. So that's a significant way of, of progressing um, the, the future forward. Because, funnily enough, the, uh, the government suggested that the future of building control, uh, the whole intention was to reduce costs and burden to the industry. Is, is yeah. that an example of it, or do you think? Uh, well, it, it's one of the examples that we hope will, will come out of it. I mean, the, there's a lot that's been done um, over the, the past 10 years, um, particularly through the introduction of approved inspectors, and to uh, reduce the amount of bureaucracy that the industry has actually got to go through. Um, one of the things that uh, approved inspectors have brought about is by having that early advice, you can actually make substantial cost savings as an architect or as a developer into the project. It's that commercial awareness. Simply understanding that what you're predominantly selling, particularly in a commercial uh, situation, is floor space. So for every 10 mil that you can save on a 20 storey building, you can actually say increase the net value of the, the property substantially. By doing that, you save more than your building control fee in the first instance. Okay. Um, just uh, one point uh, out of the blue. Uh, the government's proposed a six month standstill period. Can you just explain what that means? What we hope it means is that there will be a minimum of six months between uh, the guidance being published and the date at which it's actually brought into um, application. So we obviously learnt from the uh, problems that we had with Partel last time round that that wasn't what was happening in the past. From the ACI's point of view, we, we would actually say that there are greater concerns than that. I don't think that the industry is ready even for a six month running period. I would think nine months to a year is probably far more realistic in order to be able to identify the issues that need to be incorporated into a design and to bring new products to market in order to satisfy those requirements.
Okay. And working on some of these things from the industry side is uh, this organization which keeps cropping up now, the BCA, mm -hmm. the Building Control Alliance. Again, can you explain what that is and what it does? The, the Building Control Alliance is an alliance of the bodies that are the professional representatives of building control uh, practitioners. So we have, for example, the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, uh, Local Authority Building Control, the ACAI, uh, the Chartered Institute of Building, and the Association of Building Engineers all of whom are qualifying bodies for, for approved inspectors. What I hope that that will mean is that the actual people who will implement the regulations now have a greater say in what's being said so that there is some re realistic uh, acceptance of what's being put together can actually be enforced at the final um, application of the buildings. Okay, uh, just two quick uh, questions uh, to, uh, to finish off. Um, it's been uh, mooted that the Welsh Parliament might be introducing uh, their own split-off mm. versions of the uh, approved documents. Is that mm. true? Uh, there's certainly concern that that's the case. Obviously, we have that situation in Scotland at the moment, and the Welsh Energy Secretary has gone on record in saying that what they'd like to do is to bring in their own quicker targets for compliance to zero carbon, which would mean a new set of Part L regs within Wales. Right, and then finally, in terms of building notices, mm. There seems to be a drive to restrict their use. Um, again, can you just give us an explanation of the idea behind it? Yeah, a building notice is a very quick and simplistic form which allows a contractor to say, I'm intending to start work on the following project within 48 hours, deposit that with the local authority and off you go. There's no plans, uh, no detailed checking actually takes place and all that happens is the local authority make a check when they go on site. It's not an issue for approved inspectors but it's certainly a, a significant issue as we see things like um, loft conversions and more complex projects being dealt with on that basis. Okay, so are there any other top tips that we should be on the lookout for in the way that these regs are changing? Um, obviously to speak to an approved inspector to, to get the latest update um, as things progress forward. Brilliant. Uh, well, look, many thanks to Jeff Wilkerson of the Association of Consultant Approved Inspectors for coming in and clarifying the next phase of building regulations changes. Obviously these things are not yet set in stone and only when the finished published documents with the government's logo on them are published will we be able to tell the full story. But this programme, I hope, has gone a considerable way to giving you a few pointers by the direction that these may take. We've got more points of clarification in the study notes and we'll be returning to this subject in future programmes. But until then, thank you to Jeff Wilkerson, thank you for watching and goodbye.